Selamat datang di Balai Teknik Pantai. Balai Teknik Pantai berada di bawah Direktorat Jenderal Sumber Daya Air, Kementerian Pekerjaan Umum, dan Perumahan Rakyat. Yang berlokasi di Jalan Gilimanuk Singaraja KM 122, Desa Musi, Kecamatan Geroka, Kabupaten Bulelang Bali. Kami berkomitmen untuk selalu memberikan pelayanan yang terbaik sesuai standar yang telah ditetapkan, yaitu... Layanan Anvis Teknis Layanan Pengujian Laboratorium Layanan Informasi Data dan Diseminasi Dalam rangka membangun zona integritas menuju wilayah bebas korupsi dan wilayah birokrasi bersih melayani Kantor Balai Tani Pantai, Direktur Jenderal Sumber Daya Air Kementerian Pekerjaan Umum dan Perumahan Rakyat berkomitmen untuk memberikan pelayanan prima bagi para pelanggan dan juga kepada masyarakat di seluruh Indonesia. Senantiasa memegang teguh nilai-nilai coach values berakhlak, yaitu berorientasi pada pelayanan, akuntabel, kompeten, harmonis, loyal, adaptif, dan kolaboratif. Zona integritas berfokus untuk menunjang enam area perubahan. Kami menanamkan manajemen perubahan dalam lembaga melalui komitmen, pola pikir, dan budaya kerja seluruh pegawai. Penataan tata laksana zona integritas demi menguatkan efisiensi dan efektivitas sistem kerja serta transparasi kepada masyarakat. Penerapan sistem manajemen SDM yang unggul, berkompeten, dan profesional sehingga tercipta lingkungan kerja yang bersih. Penguatan akuntabilitas instansi untuk mewujudkan budaya dan capaian kerja organisasi berdasarkan manajemen kinerja organisasi. Penguatan pengawasan melalui sistem pencegahan terjadinya penyimpangan dan penyalahgunaan wewenang, Serta pembaharuan dan peningkatan kualitas pelayanan yang mudah ramah, serta memanfaatkan sosial media untuk mencapai masyarakat yang lebih luas.
Balai Teknik Pantai Sigap melayani dan terus berinovasi untuk mewujudkan kemanfaatan sumber daya air yang berkelanjutan untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat. Untuk peserta yang telah bergabung perlu kami informasikan beberapa rule pada webinar hari ini Dimohon untuk mengganti nama dengan format nama underscore institusi Dimohon untuk tetap mengaktifkan kamera serta mematikan mikrofonnya ketika sesi sedang berlangsung Dimohon untuk mengisi daftar hadir yang telah disediakan Dan menggunakan background yang telah dikirimkan melalui chatroom jika ada pertanyaan, peserta dapat menggunakan fitur raise hand atau menuliskan pertanyaannya di kolom chat. Terima kasih. Webinar ini menyediakan dua bahasa. Peserta dapat mengikuti webinar dengan bahasa Indonesia dengan cara yang telah ditampilkan pada layar atau sudah dikirimkan melalui chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you about the rule of today's webinar. Please kindly adjust your name or ID screen using the format your name underscore institution. During the video conference, we kindly ask all participants to turn on the mute mode or turn off the audio and only turn on the audio when MC or moderator give the suggestion. Please turn on your camera and use the webinar background. In addition, we, we kindly ask all participants to fill the online attendance link through the link provided in the chat room. We can also use raise hand button or chat room if you have any question on the session. This webinar offers two languages. Participants can use Indonesian language using the method shown on the screen or through the chat room. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to you. Welcome in Indonesia, Balai Teknik Pantai, for the webinar conference with the topic Coastal Protection Infrastructure on this beautiful Friday, August 11, 2023. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Anissa Putri Kinanti, and I will be hosting you for today's event. And now, please let me welcome our special guest for today. Welcome to the Honorable Professor Nobuhisa Kobayashi, PhD, Center for Applied Coastal Research, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, University of Delaware, USA. To the Honorable Insinyur Entin Aikarjadi, MCE, PhD, from Coastal Engineering Research Group, Institute Technology, Bandung. To the Honorable Mr. Adi Prasetyo, STMN, PhD, as the head of Balai Teknik Pantai. To the Honorable, the head of Balai Wilayah Sungai and Balai Besar Wilayah Sungai. And last but not least, also to the Honorable guests and audiences. Further for the sequence of this morning agenda, we will sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, and also the hymn of Kementerian Pekerjaan Umum dan Perumahan Rakyat. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand up.
Thank you very much and please have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, next is praying. Let us have a silent moment to pray for the success of the webinar. Praying will be delivered by Mr. Sajidin. Mr. Sajidin, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semua, Bapak Ibu yang berbahagia. Marilah kita berdoa menurut keyakinan agama masing-masing dan izinkan saya untuk memandu sesuai dengan agama Islam. Mari kita tundukkan kepala, hati dan jiwa kita sejenak. A'udzu billahi minasyaitonir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala asrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim Hari ini kami berkumpul di tempat ini Dalam rangka acara webinar Castle Protection Infrastructure Jadikanlah Ya Allah acara kami Acara yang penuh makna dan acara yang engkau ridhoi Jadikanlah acara kami menjadi suatu titik awal bagi kami untuk bekerja lebih baik Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim Berikanlah kami kekuatan untuk menjalankan tugas-tugas negara yang kami pikul Mudahkanlah bagi kami dalam menjalankan tugas dan tanggung jawab kami sebagai abdi negara Sesungguhnya engkau lah Tuhan yang maha kuasa dan maha berkehendak Ya Allah, Ya Rabb, Ya Tuhan kami, jadikanlah kami sebagai orang-orang yang mampu bekerja dengan penuh integritas dan profesionalitas. Dan jadikanlah kami menjadi orang-orang yang bekerja dengan penuh tanggung jawab dan semangat bekerja sama. Ya Malik, Ya Kudus, sucikanlah hati dan pikiran kami dalam menjalankan pekerjaan dan tanggung jawab kami. Rahmati kami dan ampuni dosa-dosa kami. Dosa para pemimpin kami dan dosa orang-orang tua kami Agar kami tidak menjadi hambamu yang merugi Janganlah engkau jadikan hati kami condong kepada kesesatan Sesudah engkau beri petunjuk kepada kami Rabbana zulamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna minal khasirin Ya Allah, hanya kepadamu kami berserah segala urusan kami Jadikanlah kami menjadi hambamu yang taat menjalankan perintahmu Dan menjauhi semua larang Rabbana anzil alayna rahmatan wal hikmah wal maghfirah Ya Allah ya raufur rahim Rabbana atina pid dunia hasanah Wa fil akhirati hasanah Wa kina azaban nar Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Amin. Thank you, Mr. Sajidin, and may the blessing of God be with us. For the first, we will invite to the stage for delivering opening speech the most responsible person for the conduction this event, the Honorable Mr. Adi Prasetyo, STMN PhD, the head of Ballet Technic Pantai. Ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Mr. Adi Prasetyo, STMN PhD. Okay. Welcome to Honorable Professor Nobuisa Kobayashi, PhD from Center for Applied Coastal Research, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering from the University of Delaware, USA. Ibu Insinyur Ntien Karyadi, MJ PhD from the Coastal Engineering Research Group, uh, Institute of Technology Bandung, and team. Uh, Bapak Ibu, Kepala Balai, Balai Wilayah Sungai, maupun Balai Besar Wilayah Sungai, beserta jajarannya di seluruh Indonesia, para kabit, kasih, Kasatker, 
PPK, Peltek, para Kasubdit dan Ketua Tim di lingkungan PUPR, Bapak Ibu dosen, akademisi, praktisi, konsultan, kontraktor, dan adik-adik mahasiswa, serta seluruh peserta webinar yang mungkin tidak bisa saya sebutkan satu persatu. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. So good morning. Let us say praise and gratitude to Allah Subhanahu wa taala because by his blessing and grace we could gather today at Balai Teknik Pantai. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar conference with the topic coastal protection infrastructure. I am honored that one of the top coastal engineering professor from the University of Delaware in the United States has joined us at Balai Teknik Pantai in Buleleng, Bali to exchange knowledge share his experience and discuss innovative strategies for the sustainability development of coastal infrastructure in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, Balai Teknik Pantai or Technical Implementation Unit for Coastal Engineering is one of the unit working in the Directorate General of Water Resources, Ministry of Public Work and Housing Indonesia. Balai Teknik Pantai is responsible for carrying out the development, engineering and implementation of technical services for testing, assessment, inspection, and certification in the coastal field. So there are three business processes at Balai Teknik Pantai. First is for advisory services, second is laboratory testing services, and the last one is for data and dissemination services. So today's webinar is a part of the data and dissemination services. The objective of this webinar is to serve as a knowledge forum about the principle of coastal management and method for business management in the USA and to draw insight for emulation in addressing coastal issue present in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, Indonesia is geographically a maritime country. Based on Indonesia's ocean national data, we have about 108,000 kilometers of coastline, which is the second longest in the world. Additionally, more than two-thirds of Indonesian territory is ocean. And Indonesia also has over 13,000 islands spread out from west to east, making it the large archipelago in the world. So as an archipelagic country, Indonesia is very vulnerable to coastal disaster. Indonesia lay on the confluence of three tectonic plates, Indo-Australia, Eurasia, and Pacific plate, making it highly vulnerable to tsunami that are triggered by the earthquake. From 2004 to 2018, about 13 tsunami were recorded, with around 170,000 people dead or missing. The biggest tsunami occurred in 2004 in Aceh, with 166,000 victims and hundreds of thousands of houses, buildings, and public facilities were destroyed. The latest significant tsunami occurred in 2018 in Palu, central of Sulawesi. The Indonesian coastal area is also very vulnerable to cyclone disaster. The Geophysical Meteorological and Climatological Agency, or BMKG, has recorded 12 tropical cyclones that hit Indonesia during the 2008 to 2021. On April 14, 2021, there was a Saroja tropical cyclone in East Nusa Tenggara province. About 108 people were dead and 47 were missing. Besides the loss of life, this disaster resulted in more than 66,000 houses being damaged from mild to severe level, and more than 20,000 to 20,000 people had to be displaced. With such a vast area, coastal management is becoming one of the most important aspects of water resource management in Indonesia. Several challenges and issues within Indonesia territory pertaining to coastal management have been identified as follow. First is the erosion and abrasion, the second is estuary sedimentation, and the third is for coastal flood or tidal flood. Around 20% of Indonesia coastline have been experiencing erosion and abrasion. For example, in the north coast of Java, one of the most important islands in Indonesia, which has a coastline more than 1,000 km, is facing severe erosion over the past few decades. Roads, tourism, area, and productive land are also at risk from coastal erosion. And due to the climate change, erosion is becoming more intense and significant. While there is growing concern with coastline retreat, budget availability is very limited. Erosion is also threatening our outer islands that act as a marker of Indonesia's border or territory. 
This issue is now becoming our special attention. The meaning of importance of managing small and outer islands are, from a defense and security point of view, the small island have an important meaning as the vanguard in maintaining and protecting the integrity of Indonesia. Economically, small islands have great opportunities to be developed as potential resource-based industry, such as fishing, tourism, transportation, process industry, and others. And for ecologically, coastal and marine ecosystem of small island function as regulator of the global climates. These are examples of erosion that occur in the border island which are located in the South China Sea, facing out again uh, Singapore, in the Plampung Island and the Dongsa Island. And the second issue is estuary sedimentation. Estuary sedimentation that occur in Indonesia has caused flooding in coastal area and blockading of ship navigation line for both fishing activities and sea transportation. Moreover, in some area, sedimentation has led to social conflict due to an emerging land. The deposit sand can also appear as sand speed, starting the river flow into the sea and causing flooding in the upstream area. The sediment process in Indonesia can be attributed to longshore sediment transport in area that are dominated by moderate to high wave. And sand speed phenomena at the estuary mostly occur on the south coast of Java, the west coast of Sumatra, and some fraction area in the north coast of Papua. And the position of sedimentary material or siltation process in carry by the river due to the erosion process upstream of the river. When siltation process occur on the estuary, it will form a delta which mainly affect the water flow in the downstream area. So one of the major siltation process occur at uh, Segara Anakan estuary, this is in West Java. Besides massive silt erosion on the upstream area, the siltation process is getting worse by Nusa Kambangan Island which lie across the estuary. As we can see that the area of the lagoon is reducing from time to time as it was first identified in the year 1984. The estuary was around 3,000 hectares until it was captured in 2003. So the estuary area were only 600 hectares left. So siltation at the estuary mostly occur on the north coast of Java, the east coast of Sumatra, Kalimantan, and the eastern part of the south coast of Papua. Another issue is the coastal flood or tidal flood. The inundation of land caused by high tides often resulting in the overflow of coastal area and low-lying region in Indonesia. Tidal floods can occur due to the factors such as astronom astronomical tides, storm surge, or combination of this factor. This event can lead to temporary or prolonged flooding, potentially causing damage to property, infrastructure, and ecosystem in affected area. The condition get worse when land subsidence occurs in that region. So tidal flood mostly occur on the north coast of Java, such as Jakarta, Semarang, and Demak. So ladies and gentlemen, according to the Minister Regulation of PUPR, number seven in 2015, coastal protection in Indonesia is focused on an effort to protect and secure coastal area and river estuaries from damage due to erosion, abrasion, and accretion or sedimentation. So this coastal protection policies consist of, first is for preventing, uh, preventing new investment, both private community and government in coastal area prone to disaster through special arrangement and coastal boundaries. Second, we can do nothing for locations that are damaged, but there is nothing important that needs to be protected. And third is re relocation of resident or infrastructure with due regard to social economic costs. And fourth is replanting, for example, for mangrove and for coastal area that have been damaged by the abrasion or erosion. And the last one, this is the last choice, is build the coastal protection structure, whereas for coastal area that have developed and really need to be secure. The purpose of coastal protection structure are to prevent communities living along the coast from the threat of high tide waves and inundation or tidal flood. And also to prevent from erosion, abrasion or sedimentation, and to prevent public facilities, social facilities, and area that have high economy, historical, and national strategic value that are located along the coast. So these activities are carried out to the a new construction of coastal structure, rehabilitation of existing structure, or operation and maintenance of coastal protection structure. 
So ladies and gentlemen, following the completion of this webinar, I hope the knowledge and experience shared here today will not only benefit for our coastal communities, but will also contribute to the global understanding of coastal sustainability. Moreover, I hope that this webinar will be the initiation for in the engagement of PUPR and Center for Applied Coastal Research, University of Delaware, enhancing knowledge, experience, and capability for both parties, particularly for Balaitani Pantai. So I encourage everyone to actively participate and share your insight during the discussion. And thank you, and I wish you all a fruitful webinar and meaningful discussion. Enjoy participating in today's webinar. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for the opening speech, Mr. Adi Prasetyo, STMNG PhD. Now, we will begin to our conference today, and the speaker for the session is Professor Nobuisa Kobayashi, PhD, from University of Delaware, USA, with the topic Coastal Protection Infrastructures. Also, the session will be moderated by Insinyur Antin Agarjadi, MCE, PhD, as Coastal Engineering Research Group, Institute Technology, Bandung. With honor, we would like to invite Insinyur Antin Akarjadi, MCE PhD. For our moderator today, Insinyur Antin, the time is yours. Selamat pagi, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Om Swastiastu Om, salam sejahtera buat untuk kita semua Good morning everyone, welcome and thank you for joining this webinar this morning We are honored to have this opportunity to have Professor Nobu Kobayashi from University of Delaware uh, who will presenting his knowledge, actually sharing his knowledge and experience with us all this morning. So he's going to give us a lecture. So maybe uh, first I would like to welcome Professor Nobu to Bali and I invite you to have a seat in front probably so we can start your talk. Before we have his lecture, I would like to read his very short CV. So, Professor Nobu, or he preferred to us just to call him Nobu, he received his bachelor and master's degrees from Kyoto University, Japan. And then he continued his study and received his PhD degree from a Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in the USA. So he's been doing um, consulting work as a senior coastal engineer ever since he graduated and he received his PhD. So we can read his CV here. He had several honors on his career and of course, because he also teach at the university, so there is one of the honor is the certificate of for dedication for teaching and application uh, research in coastal engineering. He also has an outstanding reviewer for the Journal of Waterway Port Coastal and Ocean Engineering Journal. And as a professional, he is a founding member of the Coast Ocean Ports and River Institute. ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineer, and he, he is a, a several editor of journal. I'm, I'm sorry, editor of several journal. Among others is the chief editors in Journal of Coastal and Offshore Science, and then the associate editor of journal Coastal Research since 2000. 
So he is also an editor of several books, so in coastal structures mostly, and also written chapters in books. One of the book is the Handbook of Coastal and Ocean Engineering in 2009 and 2018. So he has published so far about 150, 150 reference journal of papers and also more than 200 conference papers. So today, he's going to give a talk or lecture about uh, his recent research of the cliff erosion and, uh, and all of those uh, problems in, in coastal area and also his experiments, I think, in the University of Delaware. But we also had an opportunity to visit two beaches in Bali yesterday. One is Sanur and the other one is Chandidasa. So he wants to talk more about those beaches condition and discuss with us uh, about our challenges and um, opportunities like uh, of what Pa Adi has presented before. So the form of this webinar is more the format is more like a lecture, correct, Nobu? So it's, a, yeah, like, like more like a lecture rather than just talk. So uh, please, for the audience, welcome audience in the online and offline, please do not hesitate to comment, to give a comment on ask question you have. Please do not hesitate. So we encourage you to ask question, uh, to discuss um, the problems and challenges that we are facing in the coastal area in Indonesia. Maybe we could start now, Nobu? Yeah, we could start his talk. Please. So the title is Modeling of Soft Cliff Erosion by Oblique Breaking Waves During a Storm. So this is uh, his recent research uh, with the students in the University of Delaware. Thank you, Nobu. Welcome. Can you hear me? Good morning. This uh, presentation turned out to be more formal than I thought <laughs> because uh, I do this kind of presentation more like uh, different countries, several countries in Europe and uh, Taiwan, Korea, and uh, I do Japanese lectures twice, except in Japan, I, I, I give in Japanese with, uh, using uh, Osaka dialect from southern part of Japan. Okay, what happened is, this is my second day, and some of you went to the beach with me, and uh, after I saw, I thought, uh, since uh, you are spending lots of time and efforts to show me around, I thought about what I saw, and I thought uh, it's good for me to share my opinions of what I thought, so yesterday, so that you may be able to judge your situation around the different beaches in the future so that you can manage your coastline better. But maybe since this is formal, I'll do my formal talk first then. Okay. And uh, today I realized that abrasion or a cliff erosion is an important topic in Indonesia. So I'm happy to talk about modeling of soft cliff erosion by oblique waves during a storm. This kind of research is uh, done 
mostly or uh, heavily by British. The reasons they have uh, Dover uh, cliff, they have lots of cliffs, and so they have to predict what's going to happen to cliffs, eroding cliffs. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have 88 slides, so if you are interested, in, you can go through, but I'll show you the only essential part. This one, we used available data, and we developed the numerical model, and compared it. This is an example of... Uh, There's no right, okay. No, it's okay. Left, left hand side is the dunes. And the dunes is uh, sand accumulated and then built up. And the west, east coast of America, we tend to use dunes as erodible. Sea, sea wall, essentially, or development. So if you have enough sand, even if it's eroded, flooding doesn't occur landward. And there are numerical models to predict dune erosion. On the right-hand side, you have a cliff erosion problem. And uh, there is no reliable erosion model at this moment. In the United States, cliff erosion is important in uh, uh, Great Lakes and the California. Then question is, can we predict cliff erosion? But the cliff can be rock, then erosion is very small. On the other hand, if it's soft or a cliff, it can be eroded. So once you have erosion, maybe I, I, basic idea is this is dunes case, it's eroded and deposited here. And then this reduce wave action of dunes. These are same thing. If wave cut the toe, then slope became unstable, and it falls down, and then sediment deposited tend to predict or protect cliff. However, deposited sediment can be. Is it? Okay. Okay, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay, let's do it. Not as fast as my hands. Okay. And then, so we used available data. Dam, uh, this is the data collected by British researchers. 1999, more than 20 years ago, and nobody has used it. And they did the experiment, wet sand and sand mixture with clay. The reason nobody has used their data is this is small-scale laboratory test. Number two, there's no numerical model at this moment. So we said we'll come up with a numerical model, and we compare them. And the experiment looked like laboratory wave basin. They put sand, sand here, and they put concrete bottom, and you generated the wave. Then you create a long shore current. So sediment moves this way, but some sediment moves offshore. So question is how fast it's uh, eroded. And this is the wave basin, so it's hard to measure. And in 1999, we didn't have a laser technology. So they put, they took a photo so they can measure where the edge is and then they checked how fast it moves, H moves. And this is a particular experiment they did. This is a reasonably fine sediment, 
and the clay's diameter set is much smaller. The once you put clay, say sediment become cohesive sediment, so that it stick together. So it's, it's no longer cohesionless. So how to include those models? And the wet sand test 15, the one test they had a crack. And this is a 16 test, and the different conditions, but you can see wave height period is relatively small, height is almost also 10 centimeters, so you could argue that uh, it has scale effect. So hopefully, Numerical model, this numerical model has been used for both small scale, large scale, field data. Uh, it tends to work without uh, decalibrating model, except for cohesive sediment. We haven't done any, uh, we had a different larger scale test and that, work, that was worked, be, worked as well, so we are trying to test it out for this case. And with that, test the duration, three hours in a small scale. So in reality, it's more like uh, one, hour, one day. And this is a numerical model. It has a hydrodynamics. That is, it's combined wave and current. This kind of model around the shoreline, wave, breaking wave induced current is more important than tidal current or a wind-induced current. Tidal current, wind-induced current tend to be more important outside the system. <coughs> but then near the shoreline, this is a wave-induced current. And the wave-induced current was, we didn't know wave-induced current until something like uh, 1970, so this clearly shows coastal engineering is relatively new, and we didn't know lots of things. So now we can predict how wave change, wave-induced current change, and this is based on more continuity, momentum, energy equation, the so-called LoRa breaking wave has LoRa in front, so that's the equation. This is uh, more like fairly well established already the last 20 years. The sediment transport part, we came up uh, suspended road, bed road formulas, relatively simple model. And this model turned out to work in a small scale, large scale, and field that. And for this model, sediment suspended in the water column carried offshore due to wave-induced undertow current. Bed road move near the bottom, it tend to carry the onshore. So you have one mode goes onshore transport, another mode goes offshore transport. Okay. And then continuity equation is used uh, predict the sediment transport. This is standard price. And uh, we also include swash zone using new, our own new model. Swash zone is water goes up and down around the shoreline. So water is not there all the time. So it's much harder to deal with. And the typically people use time, uh, highly timed consuming computation, then usually computation, you can simulate what may happen in three days. This model is much efficient computationally, so, so far we did the simulation what may happen in six years. For this case, just uh, whatever the data we have. And then this is the continuity equation. We simplified that a little bit. If you're interested in detail, and think can provide you the abstract of this presentation with the references, so you can check references. 
and then we approximate that long shore current increased from zero to here. So the gradient is approximated by using equivalent along shore distance at this location. For this one, it's specific for this case. And we chose two cases to check details. One is which period is a good period to represent this kind of problem. And uh, the equivalent around shore distance we have introduced. And then this one is a different period. This is a mean period. This is a spectral peak period. That is represented better by using using the uh, spectral peak period. That's typical the case for even the dune erosion. Computed results look like this. This one change corresponds to the numerical grid spacing of two centimeters. For this computation, we have two centimeter grid spacing. And uh, erosion rate, cliff erosion rate is this slow. And this one is whether you include around shore sand loss in addition to cross shore sand loss, then it's better to include around shore sand loss. And then you can get this kind of figure. So slope is represented well. And then question is where you decide numerically where the edge of cliff. So we checked sensitivity, and we used the uh, here delta of one millimeter, point one millimeter. It's very small value. Then we used one millimeter to get the reasonable agreement. Then what happens is you have seen the cliff erosion. This is the laboratory cliff erosion. So you had uh, this, and the slope is fairly steep, one on two. <coughs> then this eroded and deposited. <coughs> if you don't do any sediment, this is the same area, this. On the other hand, if you do the sediment, Temperature difference between the time of the ice is larger than I thought, especially yesterday we went over the mountain and you see the most, most impressive scenery I have seen in a body, that the crater lake uh, geopark, United Nations geopark. Anyway. So if you have iron shadows, you know the part area and some is deposited, some of transported iron So as I said, if you have cliff erosion or abrasion, sand settled down, some of them are deposited offshore, and this is protecting this place against weight. On the other hand, if you lose along shore, those are gone, then we can attack more on the eroding surface. So you have to simulate both that cross shore, along shore, and also strength, strength of cliff against the erosion. Yeah, 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 okay, 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 okay. And then this shows eroded area, deposited area. We are checking with a computed result satisfy conservation setting, but but if it's a normal incident or a orange uniform case, eroded deposit same. But once you allow orange sand loss, you can see that more area is eroded than deposited. And then we get reasonably good agreement. 
I think this is about within 30% error uh, if you are here. So decession rate, this is a laboratory test, is only about order of 10 centimeter or 20 centimeter per hour. However, if you put this in one year, it's become an enormous rate of erosion. And then if you have the numerical model, we check instead of a fixed bottom with the experiment, in reality you have sand, but the difference is uh, that's what we check. So that's the advantage of having numerical model. It's, once it's working reasonably well, we can check lots of things. So this is a lab, you have a laboratory facility, and nowadays most of the lab facility also has a numerical simulation capability. So it's best to use both depending on the problem to get the situation that one plus one equals three. And uh, this one, conclusion is, if wave height is small relative to the water depth at the top, you are here, waves are small so that it does not see the bottom that much, so it doesn't matter too much whether it's a sun or a fixed bottom. On the other hand, wave becomes large enough, start causing more erosion, and then uh, the recession, recession is not too much different, but this is a uh, uh, eroded area on the sand bottom or a fixed bottom. And then if you have sand bottom, you tend to lose more, you, you tend to have more erosion. And then this is a comparison of if wave height is less than 0.6, computed profile almost same. And then we check effect of clay. So you have sand and clay mixture here. Then if this is eroded, what's going to happen? So if you include cohesiveness, and we have a model of this uh, numerically, and then we also we have our own erosion depth prediction based uh, breaking wave energy and some slope effect and also we consider abrasion protection. So what happens is if you have a gray layer and the sun is moving around, that tends to cause abrasion. On the other hand, you have waves, you have six hundred layers, and the clay, the sand of sand is moving, bottom is not moving. Then sand layers protecting the clay. Uh, so you have to consider six hundred protecting layers, very thin, very thin, include the erosion. That's included empirically. And this is uh, the slope effect, and this is so we came up with abrasion protection factor based on different channel for cohesive uh, great, great Lake. This is cohesive uh, cliff in the Great Lakes. And we checked the different things. These are typical input we used. Originally, similar model used for the erosion of dike. Glass dike or a glass uh, uh, levee. And we did the computation, and the test 16 is like this. So we did the computation uh, using different clay resistance against the erosion. And 5 means more resistant, 0.02 is very. No, no resistance you can, is essentially. So if clay becomes highly resistant against wave action, 
that erosion rate is smaller and start increasing as clay become, you know, sediment become less resistant, then after that, it doesn't change that much. So if cliff soil can be eroded easily, then controlling mechanism is eroded sediment deposited along the eroding cliff toe has to be removed by wave action and the wave-induced current. So this one numerically clearly shows that it's not just cliff resistance, erosion resistance against wave or soil strength, but also waves capability of removing deposited sand. So this is the first time in the world to show quantitatively how both of factors affect each other. And this is, I will check the de detail how much. So if you like, look like this, there's an empirical formula may predict total longshore sediment transport, but our model can predict distribution. How distribution of longshore sediment transport, distribution of bed road and suspended road. And this is a conclusion. Okay, then this is uh, come from all the actual uh, problem. This is uh, Gulf of Mexico. And the New Orleans, this is the New Orleans, uh, and uh, is here. And these uh, sand particles left and create the so called barrier island. And the 2005 barrier island looked like this. Okay. And then April 2005, September 10, you see the big gap. Okay, this is a NASA Earth observation. And nowadays, satellite or an airplane images is available. You can do Google Earth Puro, then you can find this kind of photo easily and available to anybody. So this gap is about two kilometers. Okay. So Indonesia doesn't have this kind of body area, but it's the same idea. So if you have something here that's protecting coast against the wave coming up, and then if you have a gap here, then, because of tidal current, the gap becomes wider and wider. So, they worried about what happened here. And the 2011, oil spill occurred here in the Gulf of Mexico. Then they worried about those oil spill may go through and the oil deposited ecologically sensitive uh, wetland area, sure. I'm sure you may have some similar problem in uh, Indonesia. So they decided before oil reached here, they closed it using Labelman structure. And the relatively, this is a very rush job, so they use a little bit of small stone, and they thought it may be damaged up to medium-sized stone. But it turned out to be very stable. So the reason is here, sand accumulated. So what happens is water depth is deeper, big wave can hit, but 
once sand start accumulating water depth become shallower then shallow water depth caused wave breaking and reduce the wave force acting on the structure even severe storm in 2019 you get sand accumulation and traditionally people predict using one line model but uh, our numerical computations uh, most of the reason it looks like this is this you can see eroded sand is deposited nearby then after you build the structure you stop the longshore current then sand came back so major reason is there was a strong onshore sand plant that kind of things are not included in the existing numerical model. So all I'm trying to say is you may use a variable numerical model. You have to know the limitation of each model rather than trusting numerical model, especially if it's a well-known organization. And typically, if you read carefully, it says what's included, what's not included. But uh, typically, users do not try to use it for any situation. Okay. Another way to put it is you have to know what you're doing to use this kind of a numerical model. Otherwise, uh, you waste, spend a lot of time and get the wrong answer. And so this is uh, just like typically a wave comes and these cause stone structure break and dissipate the wave energy, so stone is typically used. This is why we did the experiment in our room. We typically, this distance is about uh, 25 meter and the water depth is 92 centimeter and you have sand, this is private. The reason is uh, we, don't, we, we, we don't have the, this is already 10 tons sand, so we didn't, we didn't want to put more sand. So it's divided and the normal private. And they use wave gauge to measure how the wave transform from offshore to here. And the uh, uh, current meter, is used to measure the barrage. This may be easier to see. This is the case of no structure, and you have uh, idealized barrier, sand barrier. Then, if you generate the web, <coughs> all these uh, tend to be destroyed. <coughs> then, protect here. What happens, uh, this was eroded, then to protect the eroded crest, we put the stone, thick stone layer, then it's more or less stopped crest lowering and crest movement. This was, we built new against this. This we put the single layer of stone to reduce the cost and see what's going to happen. So laboratory experiments is easier to do testing to, for different cases when we didn't have any numerical model. This one, there's no numerical model. We created the numerical model and compared it. It doesn't work all the time. So situation is uh, test one, and then after more like 400 second wave exposed to more like 30 test, then shape like this. Then we said if we put the structure, it, this crest may be stab stabilized. And then we debuilt this, and then we put the single layer of stone. And then this shows uh, the reason we changed the color, because it's slightly different stone. 
sa buru is bigger and a little bit heavier, a larger density. And single layer, we just used that uh, green stone. And this one shows how wave changed. This one is the wave height change. This one is so-called wave setup. That means if you generate the wave, water level slightly changes. But near the shoreline for this particular test, it increases. And typically, if you have a, during a major storm in America, offshore wave height may be 10 meter. Then significant, we have a 10 meter, then you may have a one meter wave setup. During the Hurricane Catalina, one place in the Mississippi, storm surge was 10 meter. So water level is uh, 10 meter high, but out of the 10 meter, one meter is a wave set. Uh, the diesel, Gulf of Mexico has a large storm surge, it's continental shelf, it's wide and shallow. And uh, then storm surge drive. So on the other hand, Indonesia is an island nation, no continental shelf, but you have a reef, so you are lucky that you don't have large storm surge. Okay. And this reminds of how velocity changes. This is wave-induced velocity. This is another current related wave in this current. So what happens in negative means so-called undertow current. So undertow current create more like uh, five centimeter per second of sh offshore current. So typically we say undertow current cause beach erosion inside the subsoil. This is wave-induced current. This is standard deviation. So wave is causing oscillatory velocity up to more like, this is a four times standard deviation, essentially how much it's going back and forth. It's almost one meter. So five centimeters is relatively small. And until, uh, let's say, 1970, People are measuring this velocity, but they thought that's a noise, so error, measurement error. So we've been neglected this. Then people start measuring more carefully using something like a new instrument. Then they realized this always exists. So this is so-called the second order wave in this kind. Second order means proportional to wave height square. So this really improved our capability of predicting erosion. However, problem is we couldn't predict accretion. Why sand come back sometimes? That's why our numerical model of seashore include under the current uh, the bed road, onshore bed road. And this is major, so rapidly change like this. So wave coming here, fresh the lower, and mound move onshore. Then once you put the structure here, movement is reduced significantly, and but structure of crest went down, and since we put stone directly on sand, then entire structure settled a little bit. So when you do coastal project, usually you try to provide something like a, a, a settlement a protection against using small stone, medium stone, and then larger stone. Then usually you can do this if you're doing construction above the water, but it's hard to do if it's under the water. So then if you don't do any filtering, 
you have to predict how much storm may settle, and that's not included in the existing design either. Okay, so the point here is that there's lots of things we do, it's not included in our design manual. And then single layers case, it didn't change, it's not too much different because single layer storm was not, was not effective. And then this one, we are trying to predict the eroded, this one eroded the volume as a function of time in second. And you compare that uh, no structural case. And uh, this is a rock, three layer stone case, this. So erosion is reduced by only factor two, 50%. This is about 50%. If it's single layer, only 10, 20%. So point here is sand can move through the, stu through the structure, over the structure, and under the structure. On the other hand, if you're doing numerical prediction of waves, we assume nothing moves. Stones are intact, sand doesn't move. Okay, so you have to know how much error you get. So in a, in a way, it's a good field. If you're a young engineer, you want to avoid the established field because there's nothing much you can contribute. If there's lots of things we cannot do, it's good field. But then you, if you can come up with a new idea. On the other hand, on the, on the, however, age education do not promote critical thinking or creative thinking. You need that kind of thinking if, uh, to compete internationally. So our test before end, stone didn't look intact, even though things settled down a little bit. Single layer is scattered, even though stone didn't move. This is a new finding experiment that in this particular experiment. The reason is it's only single layer. Stone has an easy time to move. And then you start seeing gap. Once gap starts, sand is moved out. Then, since sand moves, so even though stone can move uh, slightly lateral, so we say this is a spreading of sand layer. Sand itself is not moving. No, stone itself is not moving because sand bottom is spreading out. So these are kind of things when you do marine construction, you have to consider uh, even though there's no guideline. So that's why for this guideline, three layer is definitely better than single layer. And this one shows that this is R test three layer, crest lowered, and the bottom is also lowered, so somehow sand left and the entire structure settled down. And if you compare thickness, it didn't change that much. So the entire structure settled. On the other hand, single layer's case, bottom moved here, top moved here. The bottom settlement, about 10 centimeters. Then if you compare the thickness, thickness here, then it's wider because storm moves also moved horizontally. And uh, some of the storm spread out, so that's why crest went down. And then, this is one three particular exam, ex experiment. So the question is, can we 
de produce numerically. And uh, we did the computation. Additional part we have to add is water can move through the Labrumand structure gap between stones. That's included. Also, wave energy dissipated is inside the Labrumand structure. That's also included. Okay. And the comparison, this is more like uh, input parameter used for experiments. And this is a comparison of hydrodynamics, three tests. And typically, we can predict hydrodynamics. This is a mean of free surface elevation, horizontal velocity, standard deviation. OK, this is a random wave, irregular waves. That's why I'm using standard here. This is not the regular waves. And this is standard deviation, free surface, and the velocity. And typically, we can predict within a 20% error. So hydrodynamics is much easier to predict sediment transport and stone damage. And this one here, we are predicting the eroded area. Oh, three cases, how much eroded area change with respect to time. We can predict those within a 20% error. But once you start comparing details, it doesn't agree well. So this is, this is uh, initial is black, measured is red, after 200 seconds, 400 seconds, this is our time changes. And you can see that eroded area is here, computed, measured eroded here but it moved on sure that part is not simulated numerically. And uh, this we looked into the Y saw. And then once you put structure on, three layer, we start getting better agreement. The reason was crest didn't move, sand crest didn't move around too much. And then this is a single layer case. That case, what happens, the stone spread out. That's not included in numerical modeling. That's why we don't get a good agreement. So this is the conclusion. And then uh, she's, uh, this is more like part of her PhD research. She also stayed seven years in Delaware and wrote seven journal papers. Uh, I think uh, I have now a Thai student. He, he's also a very good student. What happens is uh, we are not MIT, so we don't get best student from top university. So she is not best student from high university, and the high university is the second tier university in China came to Delaware, then she started uh, doing research, and she realized she can do it. She is better than she thought. And she really improved over seven years. So two years master, four years PhD, one year postdoc. So this is, you want to have a student who started here and when they graduate here. Yeah, some students start here, very little progress. And so you can see, even if top students, we also had Shinha students, I did it, but the other professor. They are, they are from the beginning typically good students, but some of them don't grow that much. The reason is they are already studied so hard, and they don't have too much creative thinking so that they can do only what you're told to do. Especially, uh, you have to be careful if uh, your government becomes so autocratic. 
you cannot think clearly or freely, independently. Creativity comes only if you can think freely. Uh, Galileo is a good example. You know, 15th century, uh, a uh, you have the church said the earth is flat. Galileo did all the measurements and no, God, uh, there's no way. But then he was excommunicated. So once you get that kind of society, but at least uh, people insisted and then Portuguese and the Spanish traveled all the world. And then made lots of colonies, including in Indonesia. Then up to 1500, Asia and Europe in terms of economic development, everything is not too much different. But Renaissance, free thinking, even against the religion, they managed to overtake all over the world because of they emphasize science and uh, essentially each people decide what's most valuable to them. So essentially free to choose. Uh, that's what uh, some uh, famous British historians say, wh wh why Asia and the Europe, and the Europe be became dominant? And uh, the fact is related, there are several reasons. But anyway, the, so my point here is, if you follow the rule, uh, whatever you are taught is correct, usually, you fall behind in the international uh, science and the engineering. Because you have to come up with something new, then you have to do something nobody has done before. This is the actual example. You already saw this. This is uh, 2010, look like this. Gulf of Mexico, Sidal Current created this. And then they built this. This is two kilometers. And the reason they did it, there was money available because there's a deep water horizon, oil spill, and the British Petroleum had to pay more like one billion dollars fines. One billion dollars fine. Then we can use that money to build it so that these oil do not come to sound then if this area is polluted, it's hard to clean up. This part, waves are larger, water circulation is quicker, so if it's polluted, if it's sand beach, it's easier to clean the polluted uh, sand. The actual structure looks like this, two kilometers. This crest height is about uh, 30 meters. This one constructed more like one month. They simply dumped stone like this. And then, this one, 2012, we followed what happened to this structure. And then, what happened is I told her find the Google Earth photo, and then it turned out uh, there's a monarch every year you have a photo. So it was 15, 16, 17, 19, 20. Then you can clearly see with this, the dry beach with this is getting wider. This particular area, tidal range is only 30 centimeters. So we assume shoreline you see correspond to mean sea level. If tidal level is very large, you have to check if it's high tide, low tide, but the luckily this location has tidal range is small. And then if you look at this, this is uh, so this is the structure, and this is 2019, this picture. If you look at this picture, it looks like sand moving here and the deposited. 
Yeah, so then you say, oh, we may use the one line model. But if you look at cross section, profile also really changed significantly. So if you check sediment transport textbook, let's say to predict shoreline change, we assume profile do not change, the entire profile move Siva or a Landra. That's the assumption we make. And we wrote this paper saying, you know, cross sediment transport also is important. And the one reviewer liked our paper, another reviewer is, is taught to be, believe only one line model. So I said, then we couldn't uh, convince this reviewer, so we published in another journal. And then we felt like we are Galileo. Okay. So point here is sometimes it's hard to overcome existing existing bias essentially or a narrow-minded view. And then we took cross section here, and then using each line, we can say what is the size of a dry beach. This is the dry beach with us as changing the time. What happened is in 2015, USGS, United States Geological Survey, said we want to know what happened here. So 2010, they built it. Five years later, they want to see what happened or what profile you have. This is the actual cross section line four. I showed you out of seven. So this is sandy beach. And then they put structure here. Then this is very unusual cross section. So what happened is you have sand here. Then due to tidal current, some of the sand moved here, and the rivet moved here. So cross-section completely changed. And then we are arguing some of this sand came back. Yeah, then uh, you, ha uh, you have to show at least computationally, numerically, that can happen. Okay, this is the field data, so crucial grid spacing is a two meter not two centimeters. And we are simulating over the distance of uh, one kilometer. Our onshore distance is about uh, three kilometers. And we have to do the computation duration of six years, and we managed to get it done in more like less than one hour computation. And then what she did is, uh, she compared based on that uh, Google Earth Pro, and this is the digital ele elevation model. This is common that usually, if you want to measure the detail of topography and the bathymetry, they combine detailed laser measurement on land, dry land, laser is from air. So laser can pro, uh, penetrate, but uh, bounce back or are deflected from the solid surface. But the laser cannot penetrate in the water unless water is very, very clear. So typically, people use a multi beam that's acoustic. So, what happens is uh, in the water, acoustic is more uh, effective, but acoustic is propagation speed about 1,000 1, meters per second, but uh, laser is uh, almost instantaneous. Okay. And then she said the shoreline almost the same, so how she's discretizing Google Earth image is uh, accurate. And then 
we checked uh, how much shoreline changed, 2015, and this is the end of 2016. So almost six years later, line one here, shoreline actually decreased three centimeter. Line seven here, shore, uh, dry beach widths decreased 37 centimeter. On the other hand, in the middle, L4, in the center, yeah. the shoreline width increased 83 centimeters. So you're comparing this and this. Then this is 80, increase of 83 centimeters over six years. So essentially, shoreline increased more than 10 meters per year. And there's some uh, crude uh, data, and then we use that data as a, using typical wave height of uh, <coughs> root mean square 0.6 meter per a second in the wave angle. And then when you do this kind of analysis, you have to find where the data is. And tide gauge data is not too far, uh, it's only 10 kilometers away. We have tide gauge data. And the wave gauge data, this is more like six kilometer. And the tide gauge data say that this is a tidal range, high tide, mean high tide, mean low tide, about point, about uh, point uh, four meter. So tidal range is small. Okay. And this is. In the U.S., typically, you can find this kind of data without too much difficulty. And I have Thai students, and we want to do some similar computation. It turned out no tide gauge during the, our measurement. So we have to check what has been done before beach nourishment started, and the wave data several years before. So even if you want to do numerical modeling, there's not enough uh, wave and tide data. So I think Indonesia has to start correcting your own wave and water level data. Japanese doing it for the last, uh, last more like 60 years. U.S. and Europe start doing this for the last 60, 70 years. Taiwan and Korea is doing it for the last 20 years. I think uh, if you want to, without knowing wave and water level, I think uh, it's hard to do any planning. But it costs money. <laughs> so it's your job to say, we really need this to do, manage your coast effectively. And then after 2005, there's, uh, fifth, uh, there's uh, five major, okay, Hurricane Katrina caused bleaching. And then 2010, they closed uh, bleaching. And then 2017, Hurricane NATO occurred. And storm surge is less than Catalina, but uh, this is the worst, worst uh, hurricane. So we checked under this uh, hurricane what may happen to storm structure. And this is all the different things we considered uh, to do. And then anyway, I'll show you, we checked sensitivity that this is the shoreline movement of uh, shoreline change over six years. And this is the Aron show distance of uh, no, number of days since January 2015. So how much shoreline increased computationally 
using different parameters. And uh, we had to calibrate so-called bedrock parameter and to get good agreement. Uh, this one measured and we compared the computed case, including both Alonso loss or Alonso sediment transport, Crossio sediment transport. And if you could include Crossio cross and Longshore cross both, you're beginning to see reasonable agreement. Red and black, and this is a good example. So this is the initial profile we know, 2015. We don't have any profile uh, at the end of, <coughs> we don't have, a, a six years later, we don't have any profile. So this is blue is no, blue is we didn't include no, uh, no long show sediment, but red, is include long shore sediment transport plus cross shore sediment transport. We do not have this profile data, but we know that where the shoreline is, that's the location of shoreline. So we show the shoreline, but we are not sure about profile, but at least we can predict uh, reasonably the location of shoreline. And this is how much long shore sediment transport occurred based on the computation. Different lines, different. The reason is in the middle, this is uh, L4 in the middle, shoreline is, you have Labrumat. So you learn the SAC formula in the textbook, that's on the entire profile is sand. This computation is based on stone and the sand. So that if you have shoreline on the structure, that part sand cannot move, so that's why it's smaller. Okay, another way to put it, the lots of things you learn is limited to the specific case. And if you try to use other cases, uh, you can have it easily, so if you compare this easily, factor two. And we check the height, period, direction, and uh, then we say that we can reasonably predict, represent the two waves. So this model have about 100% one percent, one percent, uh, error uncertainty, and it's similar to the uh, one hundred percent error we expect for our sediment transport over there. And then we said, we said, we said what happens to the structure if we have Hurricane Nate comes in that. Water level 1.17, significant wave height 3.54 meter. Period, this one's about 10 and the wave direction. So what happened is we don't know the actual bottom during a night because there's no profile measurement. So this profile is most likely right after you build the structure, look like this. Okay, then what happens is large wave comes and this is too deep, two meter. So little wave breaking occurs in the heat structure. Okay, then 2000, this is 2000. This is, uh, B is surveyed profile. If you put the surveyed profile like this, 2015, you already have the sand beach, steep sand beach appeared. And this profile is a computed profile. Then you have a more beach, wider beach here. Okay, and then you have this part, uh, sand cover. Then 2020 computed profile, this beach become wider. <coughs> okay, key here is a stone diameter, only 0.55 meter. Not too different from stone I saw on the beach yesterday. 
So it's not really a big stop. And major difference is your stone is located above the water. And maybe storm surge, you know, large. So question also, during the wave height, typically small on the west coast of Bali, or relative to this kind of wave. Then this one is, we predicted that during the 72 hours, how much beach profile change occurred. If it's a relatively deep profile, wave action is small, so no much change. And this is why you have a sand, so these are eroded, deposited here. On the other hand, this part didn't change that much, but this part is eroded and deposited. So that's a sand movement. And then we checked how much storm moved, damaged. And then this is so-called the stability number. If you put sand loose, you know, stone loosely, randomly, this is stability is small. So that's why point one is typical. If it's, you put the stones more carefully, like uh, the way you do in, uh, in uh, Indonesian stones development, it's more stable. And then this one damage is how many stones moved with the stone diameter. And if you put the stone carefully, and uh, ABC is a different profile, so most damage occurs A. The reason is beach depth in front of structure is deep. So sand bottom is not protecting structure. So wave, large wave hit, the, hit you directly, then damage is 0.4. So some minor damage may occur. On the other hand, you have lots of sand in front of a structure, almost no damage. And then, so sand is protecting the structure. Okay. So you need both sand and stone to protect your entire coast. On the other hand, if you put the stone randomly or very loosely, casually, you may have three stone damage. So this is clearly example of the case that the way you are putting stone takes time, but if something happens, it's more, uh, more stable. Yeah, it's a careful rock placement, casual rock placement. So this is a good thing about the numerical model. You can check this kind of stuff. And what that, this shows that uh, this structure is directly exposed. This is protected, but uh, this is very narrow. This one is wave coming here and then break. And this part is directly exposed. So by the time wave action reach here, this is wave action is small. So that's why little no damage. So having wide high beach protect your structure. Okay, nowadays coastal engineering is so specialized as far as the researcher is concerned. So some researchers only do hydrodynamics. Some researchers do only sediment. Some researchers do only coastal structure. I, I force my students study three things together because they're going to be coastal engineer for the next 30, 30, 40 years. And if you can do only one thing, your future as a researcher is very limited. Okay. So Hurricane Nate, we did a comparison and how it changes. So this one is we increased we increased the uh, water level to the same level of uh, Hurricane Catalina. 
profile change, you don't change that much. Damage increased only a little bit. So essentially, using a new model, we can check different storm, different water level, then check uh, how safe your structure is. Okay. Anyway, this is uh, experimental and numerical. And the 11 o'clock. All right. Thank you so much, so Nobu, for your presentation. So it's really on time. Okay. Good job. Good job. Uh, so I will kind of quickly summarize of what Nobu has been talk this morning. So the first one, he was talking about soft cliff erosion. So this is the special thing about the soft cliff erosion because the, cons the sediment consists of the cohesive sediment. So there is, a, besides sand, there is also um, clay. So it becomes, the problem becomes much more difficult. So there are a lot or a lot, a lot more research and studied about the sand sediment, cohesionless sediment, but with the cohesive sediment, it's a different uh, animal, it's a different story, it's much, much more difficult. So Nobu and his students have started doing experiment, and his conclusion is that if it is soft cliff or the erosion or sedimentation of the soft cliff or soft cliff with the sand and clay, then it's not only the strength of the cliff is important, but also the wave capability to move the sand around, the sediment uh, around. So if we know from the class probably that there is a cross-shore and long-shore sediment transport. So what Nobu said uh, is that both are really important and both we have to consider when we analyze the sediment uh, transport. And the second one is the coastal protection structure. This is, his study is in a barrier island near New Orleans. So because of the Hurricane Katrina, there was a cut around two kilometer, which is becomes gap. And uh, with that, uh, gap, then they built a structure there to protect the area behind, behind the barrier island. So, and then uh, his study is, I think he'll, he'll, they look into the sand that was uh, deposited behind, not in front of the structure. And the conclusion is that offshore, cross, onshore sediment transport, it's important there, so we need to consider that. And they studied about that problem uh, more detailed in the recovery of the eroded beach and the, the third talk. So they have modeling with model. Before they, they have an experiment with different kind of structure, no structure, uh, three layer structure or high structure and then low low crest structure, and then they conclude that uh, the, the offshore cross-shore uh, offshore cross sediment is important. So, and then they studied it with the numerical model. And uh, for the hydrodynamic part, it's uh, the result compared really well with data, but it's different with the, with the sediment transport part. So the error is still 100%, 100% which is, pretty uh, common in the sediment transport study. And that's pretty much it. And one point that he made is that uh, the stone damage which happen if there is a wave action, it depends on also how we place the stone. So yesterday he saw that in Bali, we really, really careful place the stone. It's really place it, uh, really, uh, what is it, in order, really, really nice. And he said that um, it, is take, it will take more time to do that, but from his study, it uh, proved that it is more stable. 
So that's pretty much probably what I can summarize from his talk. And now, since, since you want to talk about what we saw yesterday, this is the Oh, this is the uh, questions, Nobu. So I don't know whether you want to talk about what we saw yesterday. Okay, uh, we now we what's that? We kind of will answer this question. Okay. So we start with that. Did you read it? Okay, <laughs> he's 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 kind of impatient. You are impatient to answer the question. Okay, this is from Huda. Mr. Huda from the Balai Sungai Bangka Belitung, and he has the question. Maybe do, I don't have to. Can you read it? The question you can. So the first one is: Is there any seashore application in the coastal monitoring system? And the second one is: The seashore model can we can we coupled with another model, Delft 3D or Delta Rest and every every other model? Yes, please. Okay, number one. It's a definition of a coastal monitoring system. Typically, coastal monitoring, monitoring system is you did something and you want to see what happens. The typically, monitoring means you are measuring something. So, seashore is a numerical model to say, given wave and the current and the bathymetry and sediment, then you won't say what happened. So you can still use seashore to fill the gap or a th you, uh, you, for monitoring system, you cannot measure, measure everything you want to measure. So if you are not measuring uh, sediment transport or uh, velocity under the water profile change, you could use seashore for coastal monitoring. But uh, before that, you really have to define what you want to accomplish uh, from your coastal monitoring system. I guess this is a buzzword in, uh, in Indonesia, but I think monitoring what is typically means measuring something. So uh, what you need is some kind of instrument to, to measure something. And after you monitor one or two years or longer, you want to compare with some kind of a numerical model, then seashore can be one of them. And you can couple with any model because seashore is more local model near the shore, right? So example, typically if it's filled at the cross shore one kilometer, but the seashore can predict in the swash zone or a wave over topping, that cannot be done Delft 3D. Okay, Delft 3D is almost 30 years old data and my model. And that tend to work deeper water. So if you are measuring or are computing 100 kilometer, 100 kilometer, large area, grid spacing is one kilometer, and then you want to know what happens, and then if grid spacing one kilometer, that corresponds to seashore's grid spacing. Now, seashore's the entire domain. So you can combine. And uh, weakness of Delft 3D is crucial process. I don't think Delft 3D can predict uh, beach profile change. So when you use a numerical model, you have to know strength and weakness or capability of different model, and this part they cannot prepare. Uh, there are where I have found web, that's a Buzunesque model. Then Buzunesque model, maybe time step, maybe one second. You cannot do the one second time step. Uh, Farm web can do the 
maybe 10 kilometer, 10 kilometer horizontal distance, but the grid spacing maybe 20 meter or more. So you have to know what you want to predict. And some people want to correct yeah. all the model. No, but we have very, very limited time because it's Friday. So we have to cut our time uh, okay, at 12 okay, o'clock. So, okay. right. Yeah, so, the yeah, uh, maybe we have probably one more question from the audience in this room. Fast, probably. So he, we can start for the, the second session that he wants to talk about his, uh, we went to two beaches and then he wants to comment about what he saw yesterday. Maybe we could start that. I'm so sorry because we have li very limited time. Right, so if you have, want to have a comment or uh, something we want to say, and then if we ha still have time, we can come back to the question from the audience and from the participant online. So there are so many questions, I think. Uh, then we can just collect the question and you can answer later on. We'll see. Okay. Um, there is one question probably from this audience. Okay, Pak Irham. Quick question, Pak Irham. Quick question. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. So, uh, usually in Indonesia, we have uh, two seasons. The, we call it a West Monsoon or East Monsoon. And in several places, from each season can have a different uh, sand transport mechanism. Maybe in West season it's a uh, long shot dominated, or, and then in the East Monsoon it's a uh, cross shore uh, dominated. So when we have a uh, erosion problem in such coast, uh, which approach that uh, we best use for? Because sometimes if we using a uh, solution for the longshore one, it might be not the not that suitable when the problem changes to the cross me mechanism and vice versa. Mm. Okay, thank you. Did you get the question? I think it is a comment, right? It's not really a question, is that it? So we have two seasons here, the west monsoon and the east monsoon. So each season has its own sediment transport mechanism and one part uh, do have the longshore current is dominant, the other season has the cross, or cross shore onshore dominant. So he's not sure. So we have, I think, to look and then to combine both. You want to say something? Two seasons has a different way, wind direction. Uh, maybe different, a little bit different temperature, about the same. But, uh, Sediment transport, kind of things I discussed, is for given wave height, water level, bathymetric sediment, what happens. So if you have two different seasons, you have to do each season, different wave height, different direction of wave coming. This model, seashore doesn't include the wind, because we are talking about distance of one kilometer. You have to include the wind if you are dealing with distance of 100 kilometer. So another way to put it is when you learn something, each thing you are doing has certain limitation. And then when you are learning, you have to say, okay, this is the model that doesn't have any wind. So it's relatively small area, but waves are dominant. Especially inside the surf, so wind is secondary. All right. Thank you, Nobu. Is it good? Okay. Maybe we can start with the second session yeah. about your, what is it, your impression or your, uh, what is that? <laughs> with whatever we saw yesterday. So we have a... Yeah, yesterday about several people drove four hours to the beach and spent a half day to explain to me kind of project you have and came back and today. So you spent at least 24 hours. So I thought because of all your efforts, I thought I should uh, be a little more 
helpful or uh, so that uh, you, you may be able to interpret. Uh, so first we went to Sanwa Beach and then uh, you need something. But nowadays this is a bit too old fashioned I guess. And then this is a temple is located here. Sanabi Ed Temple, and this part is eroding. Okay, there, about 20 years ago, you built two groins and offshore breakwater. You need something better. Could you appear? And this design done by Japanese company 20 years ago. And then if you assume waves coming here, then traditionally you have some uh, wave refraction. But uh, if you look at coastal engineering mania, they explain that you have curved shoreline like this, wave come, and then oblique wave, oblique wave, so create long shore current and long shore sediment transport. So that's why tip get be eroded. So by building structure like this, you remove or drop long shore sediment transport. And then designer want to make sure that this erosion doesn't occur, so they put the offshore breakwater. So that whatever sand you put, stay there. So that's more like a the standard uh, methodology Japanese used more than 20 years ago. Then 20 years later, uh, yesterday, there is an erosion, some erosion occurred, but it looks like this. So it looks like this break would uh, stop the movement here. However, if you look at this side, I didn't look at this side. This side, if long shore sediment transport occurring like this, then you should get lots of erosion here. But no, no big erosion. So long shore sediment transport may be smaller than uh, whoever designed this at that time. The reason is all this methodology developed in Japan is does not account for coral reef. So Sanwa has very wide coral reef here. Then coral reef cross section maybe uh, look like this, very steep. Then wave comes. And if it's a large wave, you have a wave breaking and slowly degrees. So you can calculate wave refraction. Wave refraction, then instead of like this, maybe wave is getting more sure normal because it's so shallow water and the wave is uh, diffracting. So long shore current is smaller than they thought, I guess. And then, also, if you have longshore current going out like this, you have onshore current. That's not included in the existing design. So good thing is, whatever happened, most of sand appears to be remaining. So it's a good, good, good thing. So point here is, after you put the new sand nourishment, you walk around and see what's happening and see 
that what may be causing what. After you walk around, even though you don't do any numerical computation, if you know basic understanding of how wave shoal, diffract, and break, and if you know wave-induced current, longshore current, as well as undertow current, so what happens is, if longshore current really occurs, you have onshore current. They may cancel undertow current. But if it turned out that because wave breaking over the long distance, especially Sanwa's case, waves are really getting smaller, undertow current may be smaller. But undertow current is typically cannot see well. Okay. You cannot see. So point here is, after you fill in here, I think structure appears doing okay, so but you put more sun, and then check. So this is the case, I, some of the go there maybe once a month and uh, use light uh, drone and measure the pic lots of pictures. Then you may have a better idea about what may be happening because of a new nourishment. And then, if you really monitor, but not monitoring data only, you don't have, you just taking picture, you get very good idea what may be causing what, qualitatively. Then, that really help for future maintenance. That's a summary thing. This is a relatively easy case. Then we went to, Chandi Dasa. And Chandi Dasa, we get the two locations at the edge look like this. And the sand is limited here. And then this one is more. And then this beach has narrower. This beach has uh, narrower deep. Maybe this is only roughly 100 meters. Sanwa maybe 500 meters. So this is, this is the reason why it's so stable, I think. It's maybe very little to do with all this structure. Because we become so small, so that it became fairly stable. Huh? Fairly stable. This one, wave has easy time to reach the shore. Then when we went to beach, waves is uh, breaking here at the edge. And then wave come here, and then we had the structure here. Then wave breaking caused longshore current or a wave induced current like this. So it's accumulating some sediment. But for this beach, no sand, very little sand. You have a groin, little sand on the left and right. So that's why I think this case too, longshore sediment may not be that important. If there's enough longshore sediment transport, at least you have lots of sand one side. If the sand is going this, it's here. If not here, you have this. But this particular beach looks like the entire sand is going up. That's the impression I see. And if you put new sand, you can clearly see. So I think my hunch is that's a reason they are saying we don't need all the growth. They decided that uh, these groins are not doing anything. Because local people put this structure hoping it's going to reduce their erosion. And the money comes from uh, local government, uh, not uh, national government. So this also clearly shows that uh, people spend their, since they don't know what they're doing, 
They saw it work because this is used for another occasion. So they did it here. I don't think uh, they did anything. <laughs> so this area, it seems like problem is that once you put a structure, you get this is the wave-induced current. And then even here, not much sand accumulating. So that's the reason that this sand went somewhere. And a good example is Gravel Beach. The last beach we saw is the Gravel Beach. And uh, they put sand nourishment and the black sand nourishment and the gravel nourishment. And then this one looked like this. They put the groins, and they nourished here, sand, black sand, and gravel. No sand remaining here. Even though you put sand here, sand is gone, or gravel still stay here. No sand accumulating here, no sand accumulating here. So what it means, sand went offshore. And this area is very deep edge is here. So it's easier to go option, okay, number one. And then questions, is there any mechanism to cause sand moving offshore under this kind of situation? There is. Uh, actually, similar problem already occurred in most famous beach in Korea. More like, uh, it's a big news in Korea 10 years ago. Situation look like this. So that reason is something look like without structure. So this is also another example. You don't need the structure. Actually, this structure may made it worse. So, basimetry may look like this. The wave comes here. Then, this is shallower here, shallower here. This is deeper. So, this side, you have larger wave here than this middle. The middle one come here, and then you have a large wave setup. Large wave setup. And then you could start creating wave-induced circulation, look like this. So offshore rip current. Then this kind of rip current What happened is Korea, this is a famous beach, so people go there swimming. And people doing swimming in the tube, they realized if you ride here, you can go option. And this example, this example, nobody, nobody drowned. Uh, in the U.S., people worry about the rip current. People carry the offshore and go up to beach and uh, drown. So after you do beach nourishment, you can, be, you can uh, do uh, what Koreans did. Uh, you bring tube and you float, and then you can see how far it goes. On the other hand, the wave is too large. This may carry edge of leaf. Then it's suddenly deep, then it can be dangerous. Okay. So I think the reason this place is eroding is because of bathymetry, and this is essentially bathymetry, and this one is the deep water continue here. The edge that creates a different wave height spatial distribution or breaking wave, 
then that create web setup. The difference between at edge and here, the water level is higher, water level higher than middle, then you create pressure gradient, then it create uh, current going to the middle, and then mass conserve water volume conservation, some of that water has to go option. This is a popular research topic even in Delaware about uh, 30 years ago. Okay. So that's my guess. So next time you can check this is the case, but web has to be large enough. This is, then if you can measure, then you can write the journal paper or conference paper. We, or we measure this in uh, this particular beach with uh, studying, studying wave patterns on a reef in a bathymetry like this. And the wave comes here. Then it creates so-called infragravity waves. This is a popular research topic 10 years ago. But these are hydrodynamics only. Then you can put the hydrodynamic sediment transport. You can then this. And some of you in your organization is interested in numerical model. But these are before numerical modeling. You observe and pay attention what's happening, and then you say, what may be happening? This is already explained, so you say, oh, maybe it's similar to this kind of problem. Okay, this is my guess, okay? You can check whether I'm correct or not, but uh, at least uh, I'm uh, suggesting that you may like to check what may happen, what may be happening. So this location, this location, you're gonna have a hard time to maintain this with us, if this is the case. So you have to make sure that the bathymetry, bathymetry another way to put the word, ISO bar, you have to make it ISO bar more locally, horizontal. And this is also explained for the Script Institute. They have a canyon. <coughs> and they have, more like 50 years ago, they didn't know the wave setup, but at least the canyon carries the sand offshore. And lots of sand in a script beach, maybe 50% is lost through the canyon and go further offshore outside of continental shelf. Okay. I would like to add first to make it clear. The first uh, beach location is the Sanur Beach, and it's part of the Bali Beach Conservation Project, the phase one. So the 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 beach is eroded because because the coral reef dis has been destroyed. So, but it has been done 20 years ago with beach nourishment and uh, several groin and it seems like it works. So in 20 years, uh, it's, it is the most of the sand stay there. And the second one in Chandidasa, uh, this, the second one in Chandidasa also, is the same similar, similar situation with Sanur. So because of the coral reef has been destroyed, then the beach is eroded. And the local government, this is what we are, were informed yesterday, put, say, kind of like beach nourishment with putting gravel, gravel sands, and very fine sands, the color is black. And now what remains in that beach is uh, only the gravel, the large, pretty large gravel and the black fine sand, which is uh, mostly stays there because the density is much higher than the regular sand. So the sand is gone already. So the beach is um, 
pretty in pretty bad condition. So that Chandidasa is part of the Bali Beach Conservation Project second phase. So it's gonna start the design is already done. I think with from the Balai Wilayah Sungai has been done the design with the Kui Kui what Nippon Nippon Kui company is going to uh, construct the structures and also do the beach nourishment. So probably that's the story behind what we saw yesterday. And if there is question from the audience first, probably, so we invite one question first from the audience about the um, Bali Beach project, Bali Beach Conserv Conservation Project. Any questions? No questions, probably from the participants online. Any questions about what Nobu just explained, the theory behind what happened in those two beach? No? Okay. Oh, it's still session one question. Okay, is there a question? You answer, you can read, so you can answer it. Okay, we are back to session one. Uh, <coughs> just, just one question. Oh, there is a question about this topic. May I, I comment now? Excuse oh, me? sorry, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay. You could probably state your name, please. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank, thank you, you very much, much Ibu. My, My name is Pujianiki from, from Budayana University. Okay, okay. First, first one, uh, uh, first, first of all, uh, firstly, I would like, like to say, uh, uh, I, I want to greet Minister Kobayashi Sensei. Uh, okay, uh, thank, thank you very much, much Kobayashi Sensei. This is the second time I meet you. you. Firstly, I, I meet you in, in Nagoya University, University yeah, at 2009. So, so I'm, I'm happy. happy. I'm uh, here. You already visit Bali and give presentation in, at the Balai Technik Pantai. So, so as, as a lecturer, lecturer in Udayana University, uh, is, is it possible? Uh, firstly, I would comment about, about your presentation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much for your uh, uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, this, uh, there's uh, a lot of knowledge I can get from your presentation. But to give uh, uh, knowledge to our student also, is it possible to invite you uh, to Udayana University during your stay in Bali? Thank you very much, Ibu. Oh, this, this trip is uh, very proud in the world. Yeah. So, no flex spirit. <laughs> uh, yeah. Apology uh, from us, Ibu Puji. Yeah, Correct, yeah. Ibu Puji. Yeah, apologize. Uh, we apologize that probably we did not include you in this um, visiting program, the first, our first visiting program. So, we are going back to Denpasar this afternoon. And tomorrow is the, we are planning about the art stuff of Bali for him. So we are going to visit the Geweka because he wants to see some of the Balinese dancing. So dance. So probably if you could join us on Saturday, you could join us. Where is your location? You could join us and you can have a, a lot of talk with him probably. So we'll have time while he's sightseeing Bali, then you can join us, so maybe, is it possible? Maybe anything and you can discuss for this trip, maybe in future you can arrange something jointly. So it can be done in future. You are still young, I'm not that young, but... Uh. <laughs> yes, Bupuji, maybe uh, next time. Next time we will have a more a better organization, better organize this, this trip. So hopefully we can yes. see you next time. But again, uh, Saturday, so anyway, I'm, I'm, Saturday I'm, if you want to join us, I'm you're glad welcome. that uh, 
you remembered your 2009. Yes. I went to Nagoya, they just gave a one lecture and then we went out to dinner. The next day, I may have gone back to Tokyo or whatever. So it's good that, uh, but it's good for you to be not just staying in one location, pay attention to what's happening, so that uh, you stay as a good researcher and a teacher. It's hard to be teach effectively if you don't do research, especially senior level undergraduate class and master's class. Because what's in the textbook, especially coastal engineering, so most, some of them only half true. Linear wave theory hasn't changed over, for the last uh, 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. And hydrodynamics tend to be similar, hasn't changed that much for the last uh, 20 years. However, sediment, structure, other things, uh, probabilistic design, reliability, there's lots of things added up. So question is, how to teach latest information while you're teaching uh, basics. And I think nowadays most important thing for our university teacher is we really have to teach your student uh, critical thinking, creative thinking, because maybe 20 years later, uh, AI will start doing manual engineering work, using manual. Now there's some people doing routine work. That kind of work may be replaced by AI, like a robot depressed factory worker in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. So if we, are, if we are not careful, or unless Indonesia develops, evolves around the way, you're going to fall behind. So I think uh, that's the kind of thing uh, usually you didn't learn in uh, in your, at the Kyoto uh, uni Nagoya University. So it's going to be it's going to be a new challenge for our teachers. Yes, yes. How to uh, prepare I, I, our students for next uh, 30, 40 years. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the reason, reason I, would I would like to invite you to visiting Udayana University. University. Maybe, Maybe uh, next, uh, uh, in, in the, the future, future after, after uh, your visiting now, now we, we can, can arrange that, that kind, kind of program. program. But, but for, for tomorrow, tomorrow uh, what time you uh, your uh, uh, the time for sitting? Who knows? After the ceremony, after the praying, uh, I can join, and I want to talking a little bit with the uh, Kobayashi uh, Sensei. All right, thank you. Tomorrow, uh, maybe I can get your number, and we can arrange the time and place. Ibu Ibu Puji, thank you so much. Thank you so very much. So we'll see you tomorrow. We'll okay, see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's better to talk something for entire people. This is just yeah, getting yeah. to private. And maybe we can go back to the question for session one, session two. Yeah, Bu. Mungkin pertanyaannya singkat aja. Kemarin kan saya izin dalam bahasa Indonesia ya Bu ya. Jadi kan kemarin kita sudah ke Candi Dase dan sudah kita jelaskan bahwa salah satu yang menyebabkan erosi di Candi Dase adalah karena ada coral mining ya. Dan itu yang menyebabkan terjadinya erosi. Nah kemarin saya ya mungkin di samping ada opsi untuk membangun sesuai dengan apa yang sudah JICA desainkan. Kalau misalkan ada opsi untuk mengembalikan si profil eh, apa menggantikan eh, coral mining itu dengan dengan artifisial eh, katakanlah kubus eh, beton gitu ya Bu ya sehingga mendapatkan kembali eh, profil coral, coral reef-nya seperti yang kondisi sebelum di eh, sebelum dibangun. Nah, itu bagaimana ke, eh, 
dengan e, solusi seperti itu apakah memang memungkinkan atau tidak? Terima kasih. Thank you, Pak Bayu. So the question is um, the reason there is an erosion in Candi Dasa is because of the coral reef has been destroyed, and then uh, for the second phase of the Bali project, uh, it's already designed that the structure. So what Pak Bayu Pak Bayu's question is if say we kind of uh, say made a recover of that uh, coral reef with structures or what with other things uh, can it help or what what change do you think it's gonna uh, make thank you uh, my opinion is uh, we are not as smart as nature that means uh, uh, destroying a coral reef, some uh, b b b uh, specialist biologist doing painstaking work. So you have to grow from a tiny universe to large enough that it may take two, three years. Then they plant it. Then you question how to plant it. Then you are talking another several years. So uh, it's a good idea for Indonesia to start uh, doing uh, growing uh, coral. Essentially, it's similar to uh, fish farming. Fish farming or uh, growing uh, seaweed. So I think so this is regarded as a work of my ma marine biologist. But uh, I see Great Barrier Reef, they are doing this work, or Florida doing it, Japan is doing it. But you have to be very, very patient. And so you planted a new coral reef, then just like this year, water becomes too hot, all of them may die. <laughs> so I think it's an ideal situation is you try whatever you can do as long as it's not too expensive. But growing coral technique you develop here in Bali, it can be used also at any locations. So you can be pioneer of this kind of work also, you have lab, so usually you have to grow it in the lab. So you have to take it, and then some uh, biologist checking, can we find coral which is strong, even the higher water? So, so surprising already, lots of research is uh, going on. I don't need those channels, but I tend to hear here and there. And, uh, so coral, saving coral is a big research topic. But if you go to in Japan, coral is only Okinawa. Now, in the Tokyo Bay, they're beginning to see the coral. So Japan is so long, if the uh, coral dies in the south, maybe it starts start growing Tokyo. And uh, uh, so you begin to see the coral in a different location. And surprisingly, I think it's, uh, Tokyo Bay, uh, entrance to Tokyo Bay, look like a uh, tropical ocean. <laughs> and the coral grows there, tropical fish comes. So the environment is changing very rapidly. It's surprisingly rapidly. How about artificial one? Huh? Artificial coral. No, it's not artificial. It's growing. No, no. How about if we do artificial? It will change the hydrodynamics. No, I, I, I think uh, if you put artificial coral at the gap, you're going to have a hard time to maintain it. It can be destroyed by waves. I, I think uh, uh, if you're going to put something, you have to you have to calculate, do they survive or whatever. Then if you put something, 
then that may affect giving coral next to it. So then you have to consider all the impact of what you're gonna do. And uh, when it comes to the biology, we tend to forget certain things and then uh, several years later we tend to regret. So that's why some biologists doing very painstaking work. But uh, I really think Indonesia should uh, main protect or maintain entire economic, exclusive economic zone. Yeah. All right, thank you. Maybe one last question from this session two. This is from Pak Cahyo, Balai Pantai. So his question is for beach, which is the slope is very, very low, very flat beach. So if it is for the tourism, the structure won't look good for tourism. But the beach nourishment is maybe would be too expensive. So what do you think we should do for those kinds of beaches? Flat. Oh. So, yeah, it's flat. So if beach nourishment, it would be like, very wide, but very expensive. Okay. The, uh, instead of beach slope, what happens is beach slope in the east coast of America and uh, North Europe is very gentle. And the reason is that geologically it's called uh, trailing edge of continent, con continent. So uh, Europe and America was in a one continent and the splitting and those places had lots of sand. Splitting mark for the last 300 meters. So all the sand, there's a mountain sand came up. Those areas typically beach nourishment is the choice. It's already no structure, just beach nourishment. There's enough sand to do the beach knowledge. Indonesia is always similar to Japan, not enough sand. And the continental shelf is very narrow. And also it's similar to Italy. There you don't have too much choice just doing a beach nourishment because there's not enough sand you can get. So how you do maintain beach depends on each, each location, the each country, and then what's the best way to do is you have to compare the price of sand. You, if you compare the price of sand, oh, it's uh, clearly said. In the U.S., one cubic meter of sand costs only more like five dollars. One cubic meter, one meter, one meter, one meter sand, five dollars. And the beach nourishment, you can get sand more like two kilometers offshore, and you can simply pump it. Uh, on the other hand, example of Indonesia, uh, Thailand was uh, 20 kilometers away to find similar sand. The project uh, delayed one year because they had a hard time to find it. Cost is four times higher. So there, I think, uh, so next beach nourishment project is most likely Penta Ocean, Japanese company, more like 20 years ago. They bought dredging capability. And then in Indonesia's case, you find the good sand, you dredge it, and uh, take a ship on the edge of a uh, coral reef, then you pump, you dump it into the pumping ship, and then sand is pumped on the beach. So you have to transfer so those add up cost. So I think ideally speaking, Indonesia has to map available sand for the entire uh, at least the entire body, so that in future you know where can, you can find what. All right, thank you. So I think the key is we need to find a cheaper sand. 
Okay, uh, I think it's time. Uh, time is up, so I would like to thank all of the participants for this webinar, also especially Pak Adi. Thank you so much, Pak Adi. Uh, participants um, in this room and also online, thank you so much for your participation. And of course, thank you so much for Professor Nobu. We really appreciate your kindness. Thank you. And let's give Professor Nobu big round applause. Thank you. And I'll get back to you. Thank you for our moderator in Sinjur Entin Akajadi MCE PhD. And also thank you very much, Professor Nobuisa Kobayashi PhD, with the excellent topic of coastal protection infrastructures. Well, the next agenda is presenting plaques to the speaker and moderator, which will be given by Mr. Adi Prastio. We invite Mr. Adi Prastio to come forward. like to inform for the participant to fill the online attendance link that has been sent in the chat room. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to take a picture together for all the guests and audiences to please turn on the camera and we are going to screen capture for the documentation. Okay, I will count until three. One, two, three. We are done. Once more. One, two, three. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have come to the end of the amazing event today. May all of knowledge we got today could be used for us, our surrounding, and this country. Once again, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the participation. I would like to apologize if there are any mistake of spoken. I will see you again when I see you. Have a good day, everyone. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat datang di Balai Teknik Pantai. 
Balai Teknik Pantai berada di bawah Direktorat Jenderal Sumber Daya Air, Kementerian Pekerjaan Umum dan Perumahan Rakyat. Yang berlokasi di Jalan Gili Manuk Singaraja KM 122, Desa Musi, Kecamatan Geroka, Kabupaten Bulelen, Bali. Kami berkomitmen untuk selalu memberikan pelayanan yang terbaik sesuai standar yang telah ditetapkan, yaitu layanan anvis teknis, layanan pengujian laboratorium, layanan informasi data dan diseminasi. Dalam rangka membangun zona integritas menuju wilayah bebas korupsi dan wilayah birokrasi bersih melayani, Kantor Balai Teknik Pantai, Direktorat Jenderal Sumber Daya Air, Kementerian Pekerjaan Umum dan Perumahan Rakyat berkomitmen untuk memberikan pelayanan prima bagi para pelanggan dan juga kepada masyarakat di seluruh Indonesia. Senantiasa memegang teguh nilai-nilai korps perius berakhlak, yaitu berorientasi pada pelayanan, Akuntabel, kompeten, harmonis, loyal, adaptif, dan kolaboratif. Zona integritas berfokus untuk menunjang enam area perubahan. Kami menanamkan manajemen perubahan dalam lembaga melalui komitmen, pola pikir, dan budaya kerja seluruh pegawai. Penataan tata laksana zona integritas demi menguatkan efisiensi dan efektivitas sistem kerja serta transparasi kepada masyarakat. Penerapan sistem manajemen SDM yang unggul, berkompeten dan profesional sehingga tercipta lingkungan kerja yang bersih. Penguatan akuntabilitas instansi untuk mewujudkan budaya dan capaian kerja organisasi berdasarkan manajemen kinerja organisasi. Penguatan pengawasan melalui sistem pencegahan terjadinya penyimpangan dan penyalahgunaan wewenang. Serta pembaharuan dan peningkatan kualitas pelayanan yang mudah ramah, serta memanfaatkan sosial media untuk mencapai masyarakat yang lebih luas. Balai Teknik Pantai sigap melayani dan terus berinovasi untuk mewujudkan kemanfaatan sumber daya air yang berkelanjutan untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat.